You were right, Tech. This coaxial power steering unit does give us more room in which to work in the engine compartment because it takes up less space. It's the streamlining that does it, Dave. That coaxial unit's really compact. All right, Dave. You too, Tech. How about getting our meeting underway? Okay, Ben, you old Simon Legree, you. <laughs> Simon Legree, my foot. There's a lot of ground to cover, and you know it. Yep, that I do know, Ben. I'm glad you and Gus got those steering parts ready to help things along. I couldn't help noticing how simplified this unit looks, Ben. It sure ought to be easy to service. Yeah, Gus. You and Dave can breathe a lot easier. This new design is the answer to a mechanic's dream. Golly, fewer parts and more compact design? Sounds like a big advance in power steering. That it is, Dave. Sometime when you're driving a car equipped with this power steering, cut the ignition off and steer the car without power. That'll show you how much easier the car handles with power steering. Right. This is a full-time power steering unit. All parts are fitted into a slim, tubular housing located centrally around the steering column axis. This arrangement around the common axis is why the unit is called coaxial power steering. The lower end of the unit is mounted to a bracket bolted to the top of the frame side rail. Dave and I looked that over, Ben. Well, inside the two-piece housing are four main assemblies. The rack and gear shaft assembly, the hydraulic piston and control valve assembly, the hydraulic reaction assembly, and the worm and connector assembly. The rack and gear shaft assembly and the worm and connector assembly are new to us, but simple. The rack and gear shaft arrangement replaces the usual worm and roller tooth system. The worm shaft and connector act like a bolt with a left-hand thread and a nut. The worm shaft is the bolt. The connector is the nut. So when the worm shaft is turned, the connector moves on the worm and operates the control valve in the piston. Fastened to the lower end of the connector are an upper piston rod, the piston, and a lower piston rod. Machined into the bottom part of the lower piston rod is the rack, meshed with the gear shaft. That mechanical setup seems clear, Ben. How about those hydraulic assemblies? Well, Gus, the hydraulic piston and control valve assembly is the basic power unit. It's enclosed in the upper end of the gear housing. Upper and lower ends of the piston serve as thrust faces, against which the oil pressure exerts force to move the piston up or down. The central part of the piston's outside wall is of a smaller diameter to provide an oil chamber. Holes drilled through this area lead into the valve body and control valve. A hollow steel plug called a piston pin is pressed into a reamed hole at the piston's upper end. It helps direct the oil flow to the hydraulic reaction chamber. L-shaped rubber piston rings in single grooves at the top and bottom of the piston each have a steel piston ring to keep the rubber ring in place when oil pressure moves the piston. Inside the piston is the control valve body assembly. It's sweated into position and is not serviced separate from the piston. Inside the valve body is the control valve, a spool-type valve with drilled oil passages through it. A steel rod peened to the control valve and threaded at the upper end connects the valve to the hydraulic reaction assembly located above the pressure area of the unit. This rod is flexible enough to compensate for any slight misalignment which might take place during operation. The control valve rod screws into an adjusting disc. This feature makes it possible to set the control valve exactly in the neutral position in the valve body. Both upper and lower piston rods pass through aluminum heads which form the upper and lower retaining walls of the high pressure cylinder. The heads are fitted with garter spring type seals to prevent oil leakage. The upper head also serves as a support bearing for the upper piston rod. The lower rod, incorporating the rack for the gear shaft, is further supported by a concave roller operating on needle bearings. Tapered snap rings fasten piston and rods together. 
The taper ensures a positive connection with no free play between the rods and piston. a boy, Ben. Now, how about the hydraulic reaction setup? Okay. That hydraulic reaction assembly gives the driver the feel of the road. It resists the relative movement between the control valve and the piston. Basically, the reaction assembly consists of a control spacer, two spacer retainers, and a control spacer seal. This unit is mounted on the upper end of the upper piston rod and is enclosed in the lower end of the worm connector. A number of oil-resistant synthetic rubber O-rings are used as seals throughout the entire power steering assembly. You better tell them about that worm shaft and worm connector next, eh, Ben? Okay. That worm setup consists of a connector, a worm shaft, ball guide, and 40 small steel balls. The connector, by the way, has two guides which slide in guide rails in the housing and prevent the connector from rotating. As the steering wheel is turned, the balls circulate through grooves machined in the connector and worm shaft. The balls are routed through the ball guide, which returns them to starting point. Naturally, the balls run free without jamming or sliding. Therefore, friction is practically eliminated. Those ball diameters, incidentally, are held within one half of one tenth of a thousandth in any one unit. This close tolerance ensures an even distribution of load. Yeah, and that's why ordinary commercial balls can't be used. They're not held to close enough limits. Right. Now, the rack and gear shaft assembly in the gear housing is a four-tooth rack and five-tooth gear arrangement. Both rack and gear shaft teeth are cut across the face at a taper. That makes the tooth profile slightly wider at one side. As a result, free play and backlash are controlled by moving the gear shaft laterally across the rack teeth. The center tooth is wider than the others because most normal driving is done on the center position. If the center tooth were not wider, a gear shaft adjustment would make the mesh too tight in extreme right and left positions where hardly anywhere takes place. Do you have to adjust those gears often? No, Gus. That's the beauty of this steering unit. One or two adjustments during the life of the car is probably all that's necessary. The tooth mesh adjustment is made by a spherical head adjusting screw which pushes a hardened backup disc against the gear end of the shaft. As the screw is turned, the tapered gear teeth move crosswise in the rack. A lock nut secures the adjustment. You adjust to get no backlash for 150 degrees either side of the center steering wheel position. I get it. That's not hard to understand. That's right, Gus. Now, if somebody will turn this record over, we can talk about how this steering unit works. Now that everybody's got an idea about what coaxial power steering is, maybe you ought to tell them how it works, Ben. Right, old tech. In this unit, fellas, operation centers around the control valve and the piston. The valve body, remember, is part of the hydraulic piston. When a driver turns the steering wheel, he moves the control valve in relation to the piston to get quick power steering assistance. That relative movement, incidentally, is rarely more than two and a half thousandths. So don't think of it as a general movement of the whole steering system. Okay, Ben. Now, how does oil flow through the unit? Well, Gus, let's first talk about the flow of oil in neutral when the steering wheel isn't being turned. In this case, the control valve is in neutral position in the valve body. That leaves clear passages for the oil to flow through the unit. Oil from the pump enters the power unit and flows through holes in the piston and valve body into the valve. The flow divides at the center valve land into the grooves on both sides of the land. From those grooves, oil flows back through passages in the valve body leading to pressure areas on both sides of the piston. Yeah, and some of the oil from that chamber around the piston passes through a hole in the piston pin near the top of the piston. Right, Tech. 
And from the piston pin, the oil goes through the center of the upper piston rod where the valve rod operates. This passage leads the oil into the center of the control spacer seal in the hydraulic reaction unit. Oil flowing from the lower end of the valve body passes through a drilled passage in the lower piston rod. Oil from the other side of the piston joins with it and goes into the gear compartment through a return hole above the rack. Finally, the oil returns to the reservoir for recirculation by the pump. Since oil pressure is low and equal on both sides of the piston, no piston movement takes place. Suppose the driver turns left, then. Well, when he turns the steering wheel left, the worm shaft turns into the connector, causing it to move upward and carry along with it the valve rod and valve. That moves the control valve in relation to the valve body. Oil pressure is directed through passages in the valve body to the lower face of the piston. Since the opposite face of the piston is open to the return passage, there's a difference in pressure on both piston faces. So the piston moves and the road wheels turn left, the way the driver wants to go. The oil in the piston upper chamber, displaced by the movement of the piston, is forced through piston and valve passages through the lower piston rod into the gear compartment and out through the return line. I follow that okay, Ben. Now, is that hydraulic reaction unit working at the same time? Yes, Dave. Here's what happens. As the piston rod moves up, it forces the spacer retainer against the control spacer seal. The seal resists being squeezed because of the oil pressure inside and holds the retainer back against the worm connector nut. This gives a firm contact between the connector nut and the retainer, which the driver can feel. If the front wheels offer only slight resistance to turning, as in a wide, sweeping curve, the driver will experience only a slight feel of the road. If the wheels offer greater resistance to turning, like turning a sharp corner, the driver will feel more resistance. I follow that hydraulic action, but what about a mechanical connection between the front wheels and the steering wheel without hydraulic action? The mechanical connection between the front wheels and the steering wheel is through the steering shaft, worm and connector, the hydraulic reaction assembly, and the piston rod. Suppose the driver stops turning, holds the steering wheel fixed, and the road wheels stop turning. What happens hydraulically? Well, with the wheel fixed, the valve also stays fixed because it's mechanically connected. The piston, however, is moving upward because of pressure on its lower face. It continues to move for a moment until it reaches a neutral position in relation to the valve. When that happens, oil pressure becomes equal on both sides of the piston. So power assistance stops, and the wheels remain where the steering wheel holds them. That split-second action, Gus, because the relative movement between valve and body is so slight. That's right, Gus. Now, knowing what happens on a left turn should make it easy to understand what goes on during a right turn. During a right turn, the worm turns and causes the connector to move downward. Once again... Oil pressure is directed to one side of the piston, its upper face. At the same time, oil from the chamber below the piston is returned to the reservoir. Are there any built-in safety features, Ben? Yeah, Dave. Glad you asked. When a tire hits a road obstruction like a chuck hole, a large stone, or a soft shoulder, that would ordinarily tend to turn the front wheels off their course. The driver, of course, holds the steering wheel fixed, ordering the power system to hold the road wheels fixed in spite of the obstruction. But he doesn't have to worry because the power system acts in reverse whenever road forces jar the wheels. Here's what happens. The first slightest amount of off-course deflection is transmitted through the steering linkage to the piston. The piston moves a fraction. However... Since the driver holds the steering wheel steady, the control valve can't move. But there's 
relative motion between the valve body and valve as a result of the piston motion. So pressure builds up on one piston face, and that pushes the piston back toward the neutral position in direct opposition to the disturbing road forces. As a result, the wheels do not turn, and the driver maintains control on bad roads with a very minimum of steering effort. You said the pump's the same as before? Yeah, Dave. It's the same as we've been using. And other than the thousand-mile oil level check, the hydraulic system needs no further attention. What about lubrication of the worm shaft and bearings? That worm housing is filled with oil when the complete unit is assembled and never requires changing. How much oil does the hydraulic system hold, Ben? It holds four and a half pints of SAE 10W engine oil. For extremely cold climates, where temperatures are consistently lower than 10 degrees below zero, drain the system and fill it with SAE 5W oil for best results. Yeah, and for climates where temperatures are consistently high, use SAE 30 engine oil if power assistance seems a little weak. I see. And did you say there was no service required? That's about it, Dave. There are no periodic mechanical adjustments needed, except for a possible gear adjustment once or twice during the life of the car. This you can do right on the unit in the car. You did a good job, Ben. And if you fellas want to know more about this new power steering unit, why, there's a reference book that gives you the extra information. Dave and I'll be sure to look it over, Tech. Fine, Gus. Like all new advancements in our field, it pays to know all you can about them. That way, you're right up to date on the latest service features. Music